Who? Um, I, 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 maybe I, I want to preface this, I think. Um, you know, for years, when people would preach about you need to be reading the Word more, or when people say you need to have more of a prayer life, I've noticed the enemy can get right in there, and all of a sudden, instead of getting inspired with something that can be building and encouraging in your life, it's like, oh, I know I should read more. Oh, I know I should pray more. I don't want the message today to be turned into any form of condemnation. My only desire is to see God's redemptive purpose, his good outcome from everything that I do in my life. He only does good work, amen? So we've got to learn how to reject condemnation, and we've got to learn how to embrace conviction of the Holy Spirit in a way that now brings breakthrough, that brings an upgrade into every area of our life. So if he begins to meddle in your life the way he meddles in my life, I just want to encourage you. That's because he has something good for you. I used to feel shame. I used to feel discouraged. I used to feel, oh, why haven't I arrived? Why am I not more mature? Oh, and you throw yourself around and beat yourself up. It's a waste of time. There's no redemptive value in trying to forgive yourself of your own sin. You let him forgive you and you accept it. So um, I say all of that because today's message is about really the power of priorities in our lives. And I'm going to focus on one specific priority, one area in particular that I'm finding some freedom in. And when I think about priorities, sometimes Lori will come. You won't believe the to-do list this lady has. And uh, there are so many projects and painting jobs. And so when we begin to talk, we write out all of these things. And then I realize, I think for many of us, our tendency is we go after the first thing that's on our mind. Instead of saying, Lord, what's your priority? I've got these 20 things, but what's the right thing? For me to do in this moment is that challenging for you i mean it's hard to sit back but the difference is when you just go after the never-ending to-do list in your life what it does is it wears you out and often you're doing it in your own strength can i get an amen, amen. and so even that word that the lord is giving me now he's going to show me intimacy in my activity there's tremendous hope in that for me but it also means that i need to maintain my dependency on him, my reliance on him. And the minute you say, Lord, I want your priorities in my life, now you start doing things in faith instead of performance. Now you're responding to the prompting that he's giving you, and, and then you're doing it in a different way. So when I think about priorities um, in the next few months I believe we're going to really start focusing in on some values some priorities that we even have as a community and I'll give you just a little glimpse and we're not rolling this out yet we've got to really press in and seek the Lord to do it his way but you know I now am more clear about my desire to know what community really is about how to really get beyond a limited form of thinking and go man Lord how can I do life with people how can I link my heart with somebody else in a way that brings breakthrough for them? How can I really be part of the community of Park Rose? How can I be part of a community of people who are experiencing together at the same time the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to release the potential and the gifts in each other and express them to each other? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen a community of people gathered together focusing on Him and seeing His glory fall? Come on, that, that's worth living for. And you know, to do that, another area of me that I'm just getting clearer in, and I know it's been an obsession for life, but it feels like it's finally coming together. Uh, the confluence of all these streams is flowing together to learn what it means as you're a community together. Your heart is, oh, Lord, I just want your presence. I want to experience your presence individually, and I want to bring that experience of your presence and empowerment into a community that's hosting and enjoying your presence together. Because if he's not the focus, there really isn't any point. But you know what the third area is? I'm just touching on this very lightly. This isn't the message for today. The third area really is, Lord, you've been so good to me that I don't want to keep coming 
God, I've got owies, I've got boo-boos, God, take care of my needs. I don't always want to be about me. You know, the world is a terrible place when you're the central focus of it. Have you ever noticed that? It doesn't look so good if it's all about you. And so the idea of learning, God, let whatever goodness you've expressed in my life, can I, let me lead other people to know you that way. Let me serve you with excellence. Let me serve you with compassion and submission and the power of your spirit really touching other people's lives. By the way, to encounter his presence, he shows up where he's most needed. That means sometimes you have to position yourself like Tanya did where he's most needed and you're serving other people and boom, there's his presence. And then your heart links with those people that you see God touch in that way. You can't possibly see God do a radical thing in somebody's life and not continue to have them in your heart and to pray for them. Come on, are, are these values that are worth living for? Yeah. Oh, I think so. But uh, in our class that we just finished up, Bill Johnson shared a story that was an encounter he had with God that was maybe the most transformative of his life. And, uh, you know, early in ministry, uh, I heard something about priorities. I heard that we are to love God first, our family second, and ministry third. Are those good priorities? I, I, I do agree with that. Uh, there was a season in the church where people thought that if you really loved God, then it might mean you'd have to sacrifice your family. You were going to be a terrible husband, a rotten father, because you were so devoted to Jesus, you wouldn't take care of those areas of your life. And if in the old days, if a, a minister's family fell apart, it's like, oh, he's just sacrificing the family for Jesus. That's crazy thinking. You can try to justify it however you want, but I don't think that's the right kind of priority. Ho! Oh! But the Lord spoke something to Bill specifically, and he said, when God is number one, there is no number two. Now, at first, you, you've got to digest that. What does that actually mean? Does that mean, then, that the family isn't second? No, there isn't a second, there isn't a third. When God is number one, guess what? He's the Lord of your marriage. He's the Lord of your family. He's the Lord of your occupation, whether you think it's secular or sacred. He's the Lord of your entertainment and your recreation. So you remember earlier when I said the kingdom is a kingdom of abundance, I said, okay, Lord, what area specifically? You want to hear what terrible area he told me that he wants to be the Lord of? that I need to do is unto him. He is the Lord of my area of confrontation in other people's lives. Oh, good God! I don't want that. I don't want to confront people as unto the Lord. I just want to run and pretend I don't ever get hurt. I don't ever have to try to clear the air. You know, I just turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. It doesn't work if there's somebody consistently in your life and they're consistently slapping your cheek. Well, see, I got a ding on that one. That, 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 has, that must have been a good point. Oh! In fact, I, I remember. Um, I don't know why. I, I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe it's a, the orphan thing. I don't know. But family, marriage, has always been a huge area to me. And I've wanted to be uh, the best husband that I could be. And so I kind of like to say, you know, that uh, I've been happily married for about 35 years. I think Lori's been happily married for maybe 15, because uh, it took some growing. But there were times where my heart was just broken, that I realized I wasn't loving her the way the Lord had loved me. But then I wanted that for my children. And uh, I remember one time we were driving. How many, have you ever had this situation where you're driving to church, you want to get all spiritual and be all holy, and then you have a fight with your spouse? And then you go in and you start singing worship songs and you go, am I a hypocrite? No, you're putting your eyes on Jesus. You're making him first. That's why you can go to church and be an absolute basket case when you go through the door. But if you learn to focus your heart, your attention, and your mind on him, he will begin to deal with those issues of your heart. Is that right? And so, you know, I've always had that uh, desire to be a good father and to do it as unto the Lord. But we were driving somewhere, and uh, it was one of those situations where the kids were just noisy in the back seat. I was kind of stressed out, and finally I told them to be quiet, and then our middle son, Christopher, 
just started, you know, being loud again. And I was driving down the car, and all of a sudden I go, Christopher, shut up! And the seat, the back seat got quiet. And I start driving down. Well, I quieted them down. And then the next thing I hear in the back seat is this. <laughs> all three of my kids had never heard me talk that way to any of them before. And they were scared. They were heartbroken. They were heart sick. And I'm just, well, that little guy has to learn his lesson. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute. If one of my kids told Lori to shut up, they would have an angry father on their hands, right? And I'm supposed to be the spiritual head of this family. I'm supposed to be the example. And I just did something I wouldn't ever want to see in one of them. I don't think that's the way the Lord would interact. So I don't want to go too long in the story, but I pulled him aside. And I got down on my knees. And I asked him to please forgive me. He didn't deserve to be treated that way. And that I was repenting and I was making a promise that you watch me the next week, month, year. I'm not going to speak to you that way again because I want to honor the Lord with how I love my family. Amen? So that's part of what it means, making God first in your life and in whatever area. In fact, let's take a pause just real quick. I want to have you pray. I want you to learn to wait on the Lord a little bit and listen. And so what area do you think this morning the Lord might want you to make him first in. Is there an unexpected area or is there an area that you already know? No, I really struggle. Uh, sometimes I'm doing my thing, sometimes I'm doing his thing, but Lord, I really want you to bring me freedom in this area so I can do it as unto you. Which is a wonderful... In the past when I heard that, that was condemning. So please catch the spirit of this. If by the time we're done, you really go, I want to make the Lord first in my life, then when you begin to give him an area you'll have this hope that he's going to empower you to do that. Does that make sense? I mean, it's like you can actually get free, and the key is focusing on him. So, Holy Spirit, I just ask right now for everyone listening, everyone here, bring to our minds a specific area that you want us to learn how to put you first how to really do that thing the way that you do it, the way you would want us to do it, to get past our own past and soulish ways of operating. What area do you want to bring freedom into all of our lives? Amen. Well, keep pressing in if you don't have one yet. You can press in later. But I do want to challenge you, if all of us were honest, I would love to say, as far as I know, I've made Jesus over every area of my life, and I only do what I sense Jesus telling me to do every day, in every situation, with every person. <clears throat> I don't think so. I know I don't live that way. I know I have blind spots. I know there are areas I resist him I, I don't allow him control or influence in. And are you even willing to pray, Lord, expose those areas in me? So what are the areas that we resist him or oppose him in our lives? And when we have those areas, and we all have them, it doesn't disqualify us from going to heaven. It doesn't even disqualify us from a relationship with him. What it does is it disqualifies us for maturity in that area. And you may walk with that the rest of your life, but I'm no longer satisfied to have areas that are not like Jesus in my life. There's a ministry Nozomo and Kamiko have told us about for a number of years. It's called Jesus Reigns. And they do these movements in Japan and in the Philippines and other countries. It's kind of expanding. But you know what the core value is? I, it is very rare that I see a ministry that actually lives up to its name what they declare is Jesus reigns over the earth. Jesus reigns over Japan. And one of their foundational convictions 
is they don't have celebrities, they don't look at personalities, they don't care about people's reputations. If people cannot genuinely come to a place where their entire heart and action and devotion is Jesus is the Lord of my life and the Lord of this area, if they can't come into that place of surrender to his reign, then they don't get involved in that movement. And so at one point we were even asked, do you want to kind of represent uh, Jesus reigns in your area? And, uh, you know, we prayed about it a little bit and I, I'm going to go, I, I, this is going to so discourage you. I, I know you'd rather keep me on a pedestal, but I guarantee you, if you keep me on a pedestal and you hang around long enough, I'm going to fall because there are just areas I'm still growing in. And so when I was even thinking about, well, should Lori and I give all that time and energy and our gifting and our talent and our you know, reputation and should we become part of Jesus reigns and how's that going to benefit? Can you hear where my heart went? All of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I'm starting to stress out about how to lead Jesus reigns and what, it'll, what it might look like in my life, how it might reflect on me. I had to repent like right away. So uh, that was a very convicting experience. Uh, I am doing better, <clears throat> but let me read this. I wrote this this morning. There are those who really believe Jesus reigns and learn to submit to it. And there are those who will find out that Jesus reigns and will be crushed by it. So Jesus actually does reign. And when you realize it, and you realize who he is and that he's good, over time you learn to submit your heart, you yield your life, you surrender. You make him the ruler and let him reign on the very throne of your heart, and that's walking with Jesus. But what about those people who resist him and oppose him, don't know him, don't want to know him? They're going to have a confrontation someday. He's going to be revealed at his coming. They're going to see that, oh my gosh, you reigned in my life when I didn't know it and when I was opposing you. And that is a dreadful thing to have to face. Hey, hello, Mr. Shetty. <laughs> a face from the past. Kind of snuck in there, didn't you? Didn't think I'd point you out, but I did. This, this is our old friend, Doug Shetty. So here, blow your kiss. Okay. How? So it made me think about Matthew 21, 42 through 44, and I'm just going to read it. It says, Jesus was talking, and by the way, he's talking to the religious rulers. Back then in his time, it was the religious rulers who were supposed to show you the authority of God and how to submit to God, and they were between you and God, whether they were Pharisees or the chief priests or, you know, even the elders. And this is actually who Jesus is talking to. The elders were... Uh, confronting him, asking him a question. And Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, those leaders, and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So he's talking about the kingdom. He's talking to religious leaders who are actually leading people away from intimacy and a real relationship with God. And he's saying, by the way, God's plan, this cornerstone, this rock that the church is built on, is a stumbling stone for you. You're tripping over it. And the imagery, you know, I've heard it interpreted in different ways, but the primary one that I think is right is the cornerstone was obviously a stone, a, a, an important stone on the corner of a building up on the roof. And if you weren't paying attention and you go and trip over that cornerstone, not only do you fall, but you fall down and you get broken into pieces. But if the stone is loose, if it isn't stable, if it isn't secure, and then you kick the stone then the stone can fall off of the roof and it's going to crush whoever it might land on. That's pretty powerful imagery, don't you think? And what Jesus is saying, you know, you either become aware that I am that cornerstone and if you allow yourself to stumble over that and not accept it, you're going to get broken. Or 
if you, you know, kick that stone, it can hurt somebody else if it falls on them. So, um, hmm. oh, so where I'm getting at with all of this is how do you make Jesus that cornerstone? How do you make him, instead of stumbling over him or hurting someone else with you trying to process who Jesus is in your life, how do you learn to actually put him first in your own life in a practical way? And so we're only going to go over three quick areas. Um, I'm a little bit over time, and I know I'm not supposed to keep mentioning time. Somebody already called me out on that this week, and guess what? I just did it again. That's what a slow learner I am. It's amazing. But this is actually uh, what I was getting as I was praying into this this morning. Um, I want to look at three areas that we have to make Jesus the Lord of our life. Let him reign on our hearts. And this sounds very simple and practical, but if he isn't already the Lord of your soul, then no other area in your life is going to be able to come into alignment. If you haven't made him the priority of your emotions, of your intellect, and of your will. And so we're not going to be able to build a lot on this, but let me read this one. Situations or people make you feel things different or contrary to what the Lord feels about it, then you're giving them a power in your life. He's no longer the Lord if somebody else makes you feel something, shame or guilt or fear or anxiety. If somebody else is generating those emotions or a situation, you're allowing a situation to affect you that way, the best thing you can possibly do is just repent. Lord, clearly you're not ruling in this area of my life. A lie is, it's under the influence of a lie or something else, Lord, I give it to you. I just, I renounce it. I want to be free. I don't want to worship anything else other than you. It sounds simple. Um, Robert, are you ready to share your testimony? Robert, are you with us? Nudge him real hard there, Cheryl. Th this was the moment where I wanted you to come and share what you shared with me earlier this week. Uh. Did you hear any of the setup of that? I hope you didn't, because it'll be an even better testimony. So, <laughs> Robert shared this with me, kind of about a way he's making the Lord first, and I'll just get out of your way. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Lord, we ask you to remove any veils that blind our hearts and our minds, Lord. Mm -hmm. And I pray this testimony would be a blessing. Uh, all my life I've been attacked, darts, always gotten through. Uh, things I've done that were shameful or were stupid. I was a jerk. I was self, you know, just darts. And, uh, okay, there. I didn't want to pass anything on to the next person. Um, and I was, I shared something with my brother, and he just said, Well, have you forgiven yourself for that? And I said, Well, it was done to me. Why do I, I you were there, it hurt you. Forgive yourself. So, and make it personal. So I said, okay, Robert, I forgive you for being stupid. I hate being stupid. And then the second part was Jesus, I just declared, Jesus has already forgiven me. He's already forgiven me. And the third statement was, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Oh, and then the fourth statement was, oh, and Satan, the Lord rebuke you. And I got a sense of release. So, hey, but I was immediately attacked with the thought, well, so now you got a magic formula. You're going to share that with the whole world? And I said, not really. <laughs> uh, but there it is, folks. Um, Robert, forgive me. Jesus has already forgiven me. Thank you, Jesus. And Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. <laughs> not me. The Lord rebuke you. And it's not a formula. It works for me. So... There you go. Tell them the result. What oh. happened when you started praying that? Oh, well, <laughs> countless memories kept popping up. <laughs> and I just said the same thing. And uh, I keep getting attacked, but it's, they don't come back. It's come a on. different memory. So, yeah. praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. I hope you can catch how important that is. I hope you can put yourself in that picture. What are the areas you're vulnerable to? And instead of just accepting them, oh, this is my cross to bear, you know, my thorn in the flesh. Man, we've got the goofiest language for areas where we're stuck, don't we? But just to be able to see it, Lord, 
you know, you rebuke it, Lord, I forgive myself, I accept your forgiveness. That was powerful to me, and when Robert shared it, uh, when we were in the car, he was just like, it, it, it's not magic, it's a relationship. You're just submitting it to the Lord, and he can bring that freedom into whatever area you give him, rather than letting your emotions rule you. So for that really struck me, but then I'm going to read something very quick out of April 25th, Oswald Chambers. Again, I challenge you, I encourage you, who are the people that stir up your soul, that put fire inside of you? Well, one of them is Bill Johnson, I love Heidi Baker, and you've got to find your own people to keep your fire burning on that altar of your heart, to keep your passion going, and one of them is Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, but when it comes to getting, making him the Lord of your emotions, uh, this really stood out to me. Uh, the title is Ready in Season, and it it's actually quoting 2 Timothy 4.2, be ready in season and out of season. How many of you heard that verse? I've heard that for years. As many of us suffer from the unbalanced tendency to be ready only out of season, the season does not refer to time. It refers to us. This verse says preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. In other words, we should be ready whether we feel like it or not. If you've been part of the charismatic movement and tribe, I love the power of the Holy Spirit. I choose to be a spirit-filled believer to the best of you know, God's empowerment in my life. But there are some weaknesses, some tendencies in people who uh, are spirit-filled. And uh, Oswald is, I think, really speaking to this. It says, um, in other words, we should be ready whether we feel like it or not, if we do only what we feel inclined to do, some of us would never do anything. There are some people who are totally unemployable in the spiritual realm. They are spiritually feeble and weak. They refuse to do anything unless they are supernaturally inspired. The proof that our relationship is right with God is that we do our best whether we feel inspired or not. Come on, that's a good word. We don't have to feel the Spirit to be able to put the Lord first in any area of our life. The testimony of people who are walking in the Spirit should be their faithfulness, their Christ-likeness. And I'm just purposing in my heart. And I know, I know there are areas in my life I resist the Lord, and I want them broken. And I don't want them broken just when I feel good. I want them broken when I feel pooped, when I don't understand. And so we're only going to cover these other two areas very quickly, but I, over the years, have been the kind of person who leads with his head. Because of some of the crisis and trauma I had in my life, I thought, I'm going to think my way through everything. I'm going to just, you know, get evidence and be rational and uh, Benjamin Franklin pros and cons charts. Anybody live their life according to your rational mind and your intellect? Do you put your thinking first? You're even kind of encouraged in some subtle ways in communities of faith to do that. And yet we're called to live by faith and not by sight. Your rational mind only processes what it can see, what it perceives. And so I will just point you toward Isaiah 55, 8. I've had to reflect on this. This convicts me so much of making the Lord the Lord of my intellect as well. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Yeah, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. When you have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit operating in your life, it is creative. It is out of the box. It is not normally the way that you just think in your natural Mind, ho, which is why we need the Spirit to redeem us and begin to conform our minds to the ways that he thinks. And we need to stay hungry for that because otherwise circumstances will lie to us and limit us instead of free us. Amen? And then lastly, um, I, let me just read what I wrote down this morning about our will. Knowing what you want is good. Submitting it to him and his timing is essential to seeing it come to pass the right way. So I have a regular prayer. I've prayed it here many times. <clears throat> and that's like, Lord, I want your will, even if it's not my will. 
What was the ultimate moment of Jesus as he was facing his submission to his ministry, his purpose in life to his Father? Was going to the cross. And he declared for all time and all eternity in that prayer, on that cross, not my will, your will be done. And I think, at, for most of us, the breaking of our will, the things that we want to do, it, God wants to bless us and, and put his power on the things that are even in our heart to do as long as we're making him first in it. So what I want to end on is just uh, Proverbs 10.22. I love this verse. Uh, it basically says that the blessing of the Lord leads to wealth, prosperity, and he adds no trouble to it. When Jesus is the Lord of your life, the Lord of your emotions, the Lord of your intellect, the Lord of your will, when you learn, I'm just going to do what he wants me to do to the best of my ability, then he can release his kingdom power in every area of your life. You can walk in your divine purpose and calling. And the beautiful thing is when it's done right for him, he doesn't add trouble to it. Trouble will come, but he's going to be with you in that challenge. And you know you're going to have overcoming power. You know he's going to work it all together for good. Amen? And so I... Again, I don't feel like I connected with this in the way I really want, in the freedom-giving kind of way that I would like, because it's bringing hope into my life. It's not, for me, a condemning message like, God, help, help me make it practical. Help me know the areas that I'm not letting you be the Lord, and Lord, know that it's my desire to not depend on the way I think, to not let my heart keep reacting in a way that you wouldn't want it to. And Lord, I want my desires to be in complete alignment with your desires. And it's a lifelong work, but it's a work that progresses until we all move toward maturity and the fullness and the likeness of Christ in our lives. Amen? So, if this has provoked anything in you, I, I, I feel it's unfair, it's unkind to not give people a chance to respond. So we're going to do a very simple one, either you listening online or any of you who are here. If you really feel like you want to let Jesus reign in your life in a new way, if you're willing to let him expose an area where you've been resisting him in your emotions or in your intellect or even in the will, then I just encourage you right now as a sign of, of just that uh, prophetic act, go ahead and stand up with me. We're going to do a closing prayer. We're just going to dedicate ourselves to be an individual and a community who puts Jesus first, lets him reign on the throne of all of, oh, all of our hearts. So Jesus, you see your sons and daughters. You see each one right now with an open heart to become a laid down lover, to submit to you again, to give over our own flawed ways of thinking, our own unredeemed emotions, and Lord, even our desires that are not in alignment with your purposes for our lives, we want what you want, even when it's not what we want. Come invade our souls. Help us be a radical people who say, Jesus reigns in my life. Jesus reigns over every life, every nation, every city, every circumstance, Jesus. You have all authority. It's been given to you. And give us those minds that really apprehend that, that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, you are Lord. And Lord, by even standing right now, we are again recommitting ourselves to make you the Lord of every area of our life. Have our whole soul, and God, let it prosper. So I speak health and healing in Jesus' name, freedom from oppression in Jesus' name, breaking of poverty and poverty mindsets off of each person standing, that we will be made whole because of your presence and power in each of our lives. And Lord, we're going to be obedient when we feel inspired. We'll be obedient when we don't. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday.